Hey, what's up everybody? So you may have heard that C9.io is coming to a close. Oh my God! Fire! Oh, fire! Oh my goodness! What's the procedure? AWS or Amazon is going to shut down that service as of June 30th, 2019. So it's gonna come up fast. And even right now, they're basically telling you if you log in like, hey, you need to migrate, you need to prepare to download everything out of your current workspace and then migrate. And what are you migrating to? You're migrating over to the C9 for AWS. So it's Amazon's version of C9. Do I recommend that you migrate to AWS C9? No. Back whenever I was trying it out for the first time, whenever AWS took over C9.io, it was actually really difficult to get things up and running. Uh, some of the stuff they didn't have by default and then trying to get installed was really tricky. And then even once you got your workspace set up the way you wanted it, trying to share it with someone else in the event that you have a bug, let's say that you're a student and you wanna share it with me, an instructor, to be able to look at your code in a live environment and be able to make corrections for you. It's not impossible, but it, you have to jump through so many hoops to make it happen. They may have fixed that now, I don't know. I basically threw my hat in and I'm just not dealing with it anymore. So in that regard, if you're taking any courses and you wanna use the newer version of AWS, it's basically entirely up to you to be able to figure out how things work because I'm not gonna be using it and therefore I'm not gonna be supporting people that use it. So what do I suggest that you do? Well, there are some other cloud-based IDEs out there and there's some that have been around for a while, like Code Anywhere, which I tried out for a while and it works. It's not as easy to get set up with as Cloud9 and it can be a little slow at times, but it does work. And then there's another one, uh, Coder, which when I tried it previously, it worked really well. And so I think it might be worth investigating. I'll probably be looking into it, but I just tried to go log into their website and I got some crazy error, some 502 with a bunch of HTML code. So clearly they've got some kinks to work out. So what I would personally recommend to anyone that is learning web development is to set up your local development environment. And so the reason that Colt Steele did not do this in his web developer bootcamp course in terms of showing students how to set up each individual environment for Windows and Mac and Linux is because there's a lot of different flavors of those operating systems. And from experience with in-person boot camps, when you're trying to get everyone set up with their local environment, it is insane. The errors that people run into and just trying to get things working can be really tricky. Well, that's true, but not necessarily so much for Node. So if you're doing a full stack with Node.js, MongoDB, and then client-side JavaScript on the front end, you don't really have as many problems as you would if you were doing something like Ruby, which can be really tricky to set up on say a Windows machine as opposed to a Linux or a Mac machine. So with that said, my recommendation would be to install Node.js, MongoDB, a code editor, and a good terminal if your computer does not already come with one by default on your local environment, so on your machine. So you just go to nodejs.org, you can go to downloads, and you can get it for Windows, you can get it for Mac, you can get it for Linux. They have instructions for this stuff. You can do it with a package manager. With something like Windows, it's just an EXE file that you download and you run, you walk through the steps like you would install any other program, and then you have Node on your computer. People that are using Linux are usually pretty tech savvy. They can typically figure out how to get it to install with like a sudo apt-get command. Someone that's using Mac can use something like Homebrew, or there's a couple other options you can download the PKG file and install it that way. So that's it for Node.js. Once you have it installed, you're good to go. You can use any of the later versions. I would use version 10. I think they have a version 11, but it's not stable. So that's their current one, I believe, which is version 11.13. At the time of this video, I would recommend that you use 10.15.3, and so do they. All right, moving on to MongoDB. So when you go to Mongo's documentation, under installation, you can see that they have instructions for Linux, Mac, and Windows. And for Windows, they just have an exe file, no problem. You can click that, and you can see what they tell you to do there. And they have very easy to follow instructions. So if you're someone that's using Linux, you go find your flavor of Linux, and then you follow that. So the instructions are really simple and easy to follow. Again, if you're on Mac, click on that link, follow those instructions, you shouldn't have any trouble installing and configuring MongoDB on your local machine. And if the documentation isn't good enough, then go on YouTube or go on Google and just type in how to install MongoDB on and then put in your operating system. There are a ton of free tutorials out there 
with people that are giving basically the same details that you would get from the documentation, but maybe in a different perspective or written a different way so it's a little bit easier to follow. All right, moving on to your code editor. I use Sublime Text 3. I've always used it. I really like it. It works for me. I know there's better code editors out there, but I'm not worried about it. I have a pretty good workflow with Sublime Text and it's always been good to me. You can download the free version and use it indefinitely, even though it's Nagware and eventually they'll give you a little message that says, hey, we want you to buy it. You just press cancel, you keep using it. Of course, if you use it for a really long time and you're a paid developer, then you might consider buying it to support the developers that created it. All right, moving on to Visual Studio Code. This is an alternative. This is like really hot right now. Everybody's using it. Colt Steele is using it in his new YouTube videos. A lot of other instructors and real world developers are using it. So it's definitely something to look at, check out and use. It's a little more complicated than Sublime in terms of setup. If you're used to using something like Sublime or maybe Atom or Brackets, then it's gonna look a little bit different, but it's pretty easy to get used to and you should be able to follow some tutorials and get it working really quickly. Just like Sublime, Visual Studio Code is free, so you can download it and get started right away. All right, so if you're on Windows and you wanna have the same command line commands that we're using on Linux and Mac, then you're going to want to download a different terminal. So if you're on Windows 10, then there is a video from Traversy Media, Brad Traversy, a really great YouTuber, has a bunch of great tech content, especially for people that are just beginning. So I will share this link. Uh, he starts talking about the installation steps around 145. This is the bash terminal getting it set up on Windows 10. You could also download git bash and do it that way. You could also download sigwin, C-Y-G-W-I-N, and that would allow you to have the Unix commands on your regular command line prompt. That would be good for anybody that's not using Windows 10. So maybe you're still using Windows 7 or Windows 8, or who knows, maybe you're using Windows 95. Like I said, I am gonna be checking out Coder to see if it's a viable alternative and easy setup for beginners. But my biggest recommendation to you would be to get Node.js, get MongoDB, get a good free code editor, and then get a terminal. If you're using Mac and Linux, then your computer already comes with a good terminal. Of course, if you wanna switch from Bash, which is the default terminal, to something like ZSH, then you can definitely do that. I may make a video about that in the future, but it's a little more advanced. So for Windows, you get the command prompt, but if you wanna use the Unix commands, which a lot of instructors like Colt and myself are using when we're in the terminal, then you can do what I just said a moment ago with downloading and installing SigWin or the Bash terminal. All right, so the last thing that I'll point out is that if you run into trouble in your local environment, you're gonna need a way to share your code with an instructor or people on Stack Overflow and so on. One way to do that, obviously, is just to copy and paste the error message, copy and paste the exact code, that's causing the error, but sometimes you need them to look at the big picture or they need to look at the big picture. And in order to do that, they need to see your entire code base. So the easiest way to do that is to learn Git and then learn how to connect to a service like GitHub and upload your local repository. That just means your local code to a cloud-based service like GitHub that you can then share a link with someone and they can look through your code. They can download it on their computer, they can run it locally and they can help you figure out where the problems are. So most of you already know this, but on YouTube I have a free Git series and I even show you how to connect to GitHub. This is using the original C9.io. <laughs> but all of these commands are applicable to any operating system. Git is agnostic of the operating system it's being used on, so you could do it on Windows, Linux, or Mac. It's all gonna be the same. All right, well, that's my advice in this crisis dealing with AWS shutting down CNN.io. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you in the next video.